Planning Board and the Zoning Board of Appeals scheduled to start at 6.30 p.m. Um, I want to just take a moment and describe what is a little different about this hearing relative to some other hearings that our boards hold. This is a joint hearing between the Planning Board and the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, our hearings are composed of three parts. There is a presentation from applicants, a public comment period, and then a period of deliberation uh, by our board members. For the application that we'll be discussing at the 630 hearing, which is a special permit with site plan and zoning board commercial finding for non-conforming frontage, uh, the zoning board of appeals may choose to close the public comment period portion of their hearing separate from the planning board. Uh, once we do close those public comment portions, we will be deliberating but uh, that is a little bit different from how it may happen at a, a meeting or a hearing that is run by either of our boards individually. Um, my name is Tess Perompo, and chairperson of the planning board. I'm gonna ask the members of the planning board to raise their hands so you are aware of who is on what board, uh, and then the chairperson of the Zoning Board of Appeals will also make a statement. Thank you, Jessica. I'm David Bloomberg. I'm the chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, and our, our board consists of sort of the people nearest to me, starting with Bob Riddle, and right around except for Tess to Maureen Scanlon, who's with Silver and Sarah North. The three voting members of the Zoning Board of Appeals are Elizabeth, Sarah, and Elizabeth Silver, Sarah Northrup, and myself, and then Maureen and Bob Riddle are alternates. And um, yeah, the, the reason for the joint meeting is, is for the sake of efficiency for everybody involved so that members of the public and applicants don't have to go to two different meetings on different nights or different times. Um, but beyond that, as Tess indicated, um, each of our boards has different jurisdiction under the zoning ordinance. And um, I'll just mention now that the zoning boards, I think Tess already said it, the zoning boards uh, role here is simply to make a determination that based on the limited amount of frontage does the uh, does the proposed project um, satisfy the requirement or, or enable us to find that uh, it is not more detrimental to the characteristics of the neighborhood but based solely on the nonconformity involving frontage virtually everything else um, relates to the, uh, the jurisdiction of the planning board and the decision-making process of the planning board. And that's why we might actually, as Tess said, I'm repeating her, close our hearing earlier, perhaps make a vote, depending on how our board feels, and we'll be communicating that during the course of the hearing. And two quick reminders. Once we do close the public comment portion of the hearing and our board reports, begin our own deliberations and discussion. The public is welcome to remain in the room, but, but once that public hearing has closed, um, excuse me, that public comment portion has closed, um, we will be discussing things among ourselves. So that will be um, you know, the, the sort of end of hearing information from you um, and moving into our discussion. Uh, I also want to welcome Marissa Elkins, who's a new member of the Planning Board. Thank you for volunteering. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> but, this is volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get a mint? Because <laughs> uh, And then Mark Sullivan has a statement as well. Uh, good evening. Uh, the presenter for this first project is, uh, I think Jeff, you're presenting for uh, Birch Design. Because of the nature of my work, uh, I've had a professional relationship with Birch Design uh, several times over the years. Uh, I don't believe that prevents me from being objective on this particular project. If anybody in the audience thinks differently, if you raise your hand, I can recuse myself uh, from this hearing. And I should make the same comment just professionally as a real estate attorney. I've had various interactions over the years with Berkshire Design, um, and so I, I think I'll make the I'll make the same comment and request. I don't feel that it will affect my ability to be objective, but if there's anyone who has an objection to my sitting in the hearing, please raise your hand. And I don't see anybody, thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, so our first hearing is to begin at 6.30. It is a special permit, a site plan, and zoning board commercial finding for non-conforming frontage by Benjamin Lewis for 15 residential units and site-related development at 34 Dewey Court, Northampton, that ID 31D-217. Uh, and this time we'll hear a presentation from the applicant. Thank you. Um, 
And just before I start, just for clarification purposes, would you, would the board boards prefer one single presentation, or would you like a quick presentation on the zoning nonconformities first, which is probably just two slides, and then a larger discussion presentation afterwards, or do it all at once? Which will take a little bit longer. Could people speak up a little louder, please? His question was whether um, our boards would prefer him to split up his presentations for zoning related information and then planning related information. Do I, 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 I think that would be useful? I, th I was going to say if it's two slides, sure. Uh, it's two slides. If it were going to yes. take longer, I would, I would say no. But no, I think for the zoning board purposes, it's two slides. So Thank that's, you. Yeah. So we have to do that. Okay. Great. Um, so for the record, Jeff Squire from the Virtual Design Group um, here on behalf of Benjamin Lewis, um, proponent for the project. Um, the project is located at, at 34 Dewey Court, which is uh, parcel highlighted on the on the slide. It's the uh, 1.3 acre parcel located at the end of Dewey Court. Um, currently, there's a, a single family house, uh, driveway, and detached garage. Um, the the current nonconformity has to do with the amount of frontage that's available on a public way. Right now, there is a 50-foot right-of-way on Dewey Court, so that property line at the end of Dewey Court is 50 feet. I think the, the frontage requirement in the URC zone is 50 feet. Um, our, um, the understanding is that the definition of frontage does not apply to the end of a road, such as this arrangement here. There are no changes to the lot um, dimensions, frontage, um, any other uh, dimensional requirement. The proposed project includes um, <coughs> preserving the existing house, uh, new apartment building, and uh, associated site work, but the driveway entrance and frontage along Dewey Court will remain exactly the same it is now. Um, the use is currently residential. It will be a residential use in the future. I think I will leave it at that for the purposes of zoning. <coughs> Um, I don't know if our board wants to ask any questions now about this or if we feel the need to hear a little more detail. But as I understand what you're saying, the requirement in the zoning district is 50 feet. We actually have 50 feet. Right. It's just not, but it's 50 feet at the end of a street, which right. just as a technicality does not count. Exactly. But it's not even like we have, the issue is we have 40 feet and we need 50 feet. We have 50 feet. Correct. Right. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, maybe that's I it mean, for the zoning board. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would just say, I mean, from as, in terms of technicality, since we don't call that frontage, we would say there's a technically zero frontage, but it stays zero. So, and, and or either, either way, nothing's changing. Yeah. It sort of feels like uh, a distinction without a difference, but but any, any, any comments from the zoning board? Sure. I, I, my only question is procedurally. I mean, should we just wrap up the zoning board and, and allow the planning board to continue? Uh, uh, is there any? I, I think that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but procedurally, if the zoning, what the zoning board is tasked with is making a determination that the development, despite the nonconformity, is not more detrimental. But the only nonconformity we're talking about is that either, depending on how you look at it, the fact that there's zero frontage or that there's 50 feet of frontage, but it doesn't qualify as frontage. Right. right. And then how does that affect the access? But you know, you would still need to, you know, because it's a public hearing, you still need to hear. Um, so you probably want to get, you know, on the issue of substantially of more detrimental. Right. Yeah, okay. Right. So, so I think that makes sense. So we'll, we'll as long as the comments are directed specifically right. to this particular issue, not the overall. Right. I mean, you could certainly do, do, uh, you could ask the public, <laughs> ask the um, people to divide their comments based on how they think that might. Maybe we could do that after the presentation, yeah. the rest of the presentation, so that sure. so that both boards get the benefit of the understanding of the entire yeah. proposal, and then maybe after that we can hear comments from the public just relating to frontage, the one issue for zoning board, and then we'll take it. Okay.
Can you speak up? Can we can hear you. What she said is that, the, again, to reiterate, the reason that we are combining this into a joint hearing is so that the applicant does not have to go to multiple different hearings on multiple nights, that um, streamlining is um, something that the city does. And, 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 the, and public, so that the well. public doesn't have to um, go to multiple you know, hearings. That's so. a common practice among many municipalities to try to streamline these sorts of hearings. So. Okay. okay. So then a larger presentation. Yes. Okay. So I will turn it over to the applicant just for a quick introduction, and we'll be back up here. Yeah. Hi, and good evening. My name is Ben Lewis, and I'm the developer working on the project at 34 Dewey Court. I'd like to begin this evening with an introduction to the project, and then I'll turn it over to our architect Charles Roberts from Hume Riddle. Jeff Squire, our landscape architect from Berkshire Design Group, will be available to answer any technical questions you may have. After hearing about 34 Dewey Court from a real estate colleague and seeing the initial plans provided by an earlier developer, I decided I'd love to see the property. When I got there, though, I almost walked away because the development drawings I had reviewed in an office presented differently when I saw the site in person. These plans proposed destroying what I saw in front of me. I saw then that while removing the two large trees from the central driveway would open up the space and allow more options, it destroyed the site's peace. Reluctantly, I went into the house, also slated for demolition in the original plans. And when I went in, I was charmed. The period woodwork hand straight by the former resident of the home was just one indication that the house was special and it had to have a place in our vision. At that point, I knew that if we were to proceed with the investment, our development would look different than the development plans I had originally seen. What you see before you tonight is the result of many months of thought, discussion, and careful consideration between myself and the professionals in front of you. A 15-unit apartment building and clubhouse. While this number is far less than the 26 units I had originally envisioned, Jeff and Charles have helped me to understand how this reduced number of units reflects what best fits the site. I'll ask Charles to expand further in a few moments about these architectural designs, but for me, this project began with what was inside. Creative, energy-efficient design and condensed living spaces will be core to 21st century urban living, but we also wanted to provide the most we could for our future residents. Nine-foot ceilings, ensuite bathrooms and dressing areas, covered carports and open-air balconies are a few of the design elements central to the building. New housing development has huge capital costs, and since we could only hope to drive these costs down marginally, we decided instead to provide the best living environment we could dream of where someone can reside, work, and relax in a beautiful setting. The turn of the century existing home will be converted into a clubhouse for our residents, which will feature co-working space, a communal kitchen, rooms for rent, private workspaces, and a quiet library and reading room. In designing smaller living spaces, we struggled with how to handle the few times a year when a resident needs more space than she typically has. We see the clubhouse as a place that can meet the occasional needs of a single resident who opts for a one-bedroom apartment, but wants to house an out-of-town guest for a night or two. Additionally, its many social features will serve as the perfect location for an at-home worker to work outside his apartment, for a family who chooses to host an Oscars party, or for our management group to bring in select local lecturers. This is one of those cases where thinking a bit broader has produced a more desirable product. Our plans were informed by the goals set forth as part of the city's 2013 changes to design energy-efficient housing with smaller units more smartly designed. 12 of our 15 units are under 1,000 square feet. Sorry. Go ahead and schedule this. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Twelve of our 15 units are under 1,000 square feet and will perfectly suit an individual, couple, small family, or roommates. The other three units are designed to provide an opportunity for families and friends to live in a new green building in a natural setting, all in a walkable downtown location. We can't know for certain who may choose to rent in our community, so we try to design versatile homes for a diverse population. Northampton has a housing shortage, and from a development perspective, we are proud to bring units with just the right amount of space to this previously private parcel of land. As it sits now, one family home has been dominating nearly an acre and a half of prime downtown real estate. 
Our proposal extends this ideal location to future residents of this apartment community. While the zoning changes informed by the 2008 Sustainable Northampton Comprehensive Plan allows for up to 26 units on a site this large, I encourage Charles and Jeff to see what made sense in their professional opinions. In the end, they designed a significantly smaller building and grounds that fit the site appropriately, providing ample living room without superfluous space and enough parking to support our future residents and their guests. At the neighborhood meeting we hosted a few months ago, one of the major concerns that was raised was that of parking spillover onto Dewey Court, and by extension, turning onto South Street from Dewey Court. As promised, I reached out to both the parking department and the police department, and found out that in the past three years there haven't been any parking tickets issued on Dewey Court, in contrast to more than 100 that have been issued on Fruit Street, just the other side. In the nine months since I've been in the neighborhood regularly, there have been times when I was driving down Dewey Court and saw one or two cars on the street and other days when there were only one or two available spots. With that said, we want to be sensitive to the neighborhood experience, and as such, while we understand that the city encourages on-street parking using existing infrastructure, we are asking for permission to put in 22 spots, three beyond the recommended 19. As Charles will elaborate shortly, the majority of these spots are covered and backed, as you can see, so as to limit, I'm sorry, so as to limit the light pollution on our neighbors. While we are making every effort to have this project be as environmentally considered as possible and don't want to pave unnecessarily, we felt that given the neighborhood concerns, adding a few additional guest parking spaces was beneficial and fit in with just site design. The Northampton Police Department informed me that in the past five and a half years, there have been a total of six traffic accidents at the corner of Dewey Court and South Street. Anecdotally, I can share that I have witnessed numerous cars speeding down South Street toward Old South as someone was coming and scooting into the right lane just in front of Dewey Court. I was actually hit in my vehicle on the southbound side of the street by someone coming from the center of town too quickly. I can only share my personal experience on Dewey Court, and trying to make a right or a left can be challenging. It may take waiting for a car or a few to pass, but like so many other streets so close to the center of town, with a little patience, I've never had to wait more than 20 seconds. In fact, most of the time, drivers are just as likely to stop and wave you on. I think it's fair to say that we all understand that the corner of Dewey Court and South Street is a terrible corner, one that would probably receive a D or F rating already if we were to commission a full-blown traffic study. However, while it's a bad intersection, what we're proposing isn't going to dramatically change the experience. Most importantly to us, as we try to future-proof an apartment community, one of the site's main benefits is that it is walkable to downtown. And not just we can walk if the weather's nice, but really walkable. Doing our best to alleviate unnecessary vehicle traffic in the neighborhood, Jeff has designed a walking path that will connect Dewey Court through our site to the existing footpath down to, foot, down to Fruit Street. We look forward to encouraging not just our residents, but all our neighbors to make use of this new footbridge. As Jeff will explain in just a moment, in this development, we will be improving the city's sewer and water lines but mostly what we'll be doing is making the most of a 1.3 acre parcel that had previously only been enjoyed with by one family. With this project, we hope to bring a new type of housing to Northampton and serve as stewards of this beautiful property for many years to come. In addition to help from the police department and the parking enforcement office, I'd like to pause to thank Car Carolyn and Wayne in the Office of Planning and Sustainability who have met with us countless times throughout this project. You served as gentle guides, reminding us both of what is needed by the city and what is desired by the immediate neighbors. To Councilman Nash, I genuinely appreciate the thought, care, and feedback you have continued to share with me about our project. Your genuine care about your city and your constituents is obvious. While I don't know if anyone from Smith College Administration is in the room, I'd like to issue a special thank you to them as they have been instrumental in working with Jeff in helping us navigate the water and sewer issues associated with improving this site. And to the neighbors, I recognize that this project will be a new change for this established neighborhood. We've tried to be thoughtful and careful with the development, making it beautiful while still shielding it from the street so as to protect the natural green screen provided by our rich tree canopy. We are committed to being good neighbors for the future and look forward to welcoming you at an open house when the project is completed. Thank you very much for your time tonight and your willingness to help ensure that the future of Northampton is sustainable and meets the needs and desires of current and future Northampton residents. Okay. Thank you. Great, well, thank you. So what I'll do is 
quickly run through um, the major elements of the site plan, uh, many of which were touched on already. Um, and um, there's two more chairs up front here. And so, as I mentioned, um, this the site sits at the end of Dewey Court, um, the single family house uh, to the east. There's a large open lawn area that currently exists on the western portion of the site. Um, everything sort of where my cursor is now on the right side of the site drops off steeply downhill for the residences on Fruit Street. Uh, the surrounding land um, to the west and south is housing authority, um, the southeast. The remainder of what you see tree canopy um, on is, is largely Smith College property. Um, as you mentioned, the, the proposed site, uh, the proposed project includes a three-story um, apartment building that uh, encompasses roughly uh, 7,000 square feet total on, on three floors. Um, it contains 15 new residential apartment units, um, a combination of one, two, and four bedroom, uh, four bedroom units. The driveway into the site will remain as is currently, um, currently existing. Um, there will be new parking and a drive to the west. The driveway to the east is going to be maintained um, in its current location. The addition of carports along the northerly, uh, northerly property boundary will, uh, will offer cover parking opportunities. There's room for storage in the backs of the uh, carports. And additionally, they, um, there are solid walls on the three sides, northeast and, and west walls, um, thus shielding uh, parking lot and headlights from, from adjacent properties. Um, as, as Ben mentioned, we are proposing a total of 22 parking spaces. I believe there's 19 that are required by zoning for this district, so we are providing um, a few additional spaces for, for overflow and for visitors. Um, the site plan also includes a roughly a 2,300 square foot um, open park space between the new and the proposed building. Uh, the requirement is that we have um, roughly 450 square feet, so we almost quadrupled that. Um, that's going to be largely a lawn area underneath one of the large sugar maples. Uh, it will include uh, seat wall benches, uh, picnic table, grill, um, again, just other outdoor amenities for, for the residents. Um, this also translates to, by zoning, roughly 58% open space. Um, the requirement is 30% is open space in the URC districts for almost doubling the amount of open space for zoning, um, the zoning requirements. Um, and then lastly, as, as, uh, as Ben pointed out, there's currently a, uh, a, a heavily used footpath that runs from the end of Dewey Court um, diagonally through the site, um, sort of the southwest to pick up an existing gravel carriage road on the Smith property. This is used to get to Fruit Street, um, to the Children's Center up in the Smith College property, but it's a, a heavily worn footpath that we understand gets a fair amount of use, so it was a, uh, a real goal of this project to try and figure out a way to incorporate that path. Even though you're inviting the public onto private property, we felt that was an important um, feature feature and um, uh, an element in the site, so we've worked to maintain that pedestrian connection through that common space um, to a footbridge which crosses an isolated wetland um, on, on the Smith property. Uh, again, as, as Ben pointed out, we are working with uh, college officials for the necessary easements for this footpath and some of the utilities that I'll talk about later. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll just run through some of the highlights of, um, of some of the zoning requirements uh, with respect to lighting. Um, all of these lights will be uh, dark sky compliant. They are uh, LED dark sky compliant and fully shielded lights. It's a combination of small wall packs um, on the buildings, um, recessed lighting underneath the ceiling of the carports. Um, which again, glare and, and visibility from, from those will be cut off at the, at the uh, outside walls of the carports. And then we've got some small bollards, uh, site bollards, at the end of the turnaround, uh, again, just to maintain that, uh, that pedestrian safety and, um, and not overly light the site. Um, again, all, all lights are, are dark stock compliant, they're full cut off, um, 3,000 Kelvin or less. Um, and so we feel this is, is certainly in compliance with the, with the um, lighting of uh, the bylaw. Uh, in terms of stormwater, currently 
there's a portion of Dewey Court um, that flows onto this site via the, the drive and, and turnaround. Um, there's no other stormwater management infrastructure on this site now, so that was just really a challenge for us, especially with the development of this um, magnitude. So we were, um, we were very focused on trying to break up the watersheds into <coughs> smaller sub-watersheds. So what we've developed is a drainage plan that includes uh, four rain gardens, which you can see in green. Um, those are largely there to handle some of the initial runoff from the parking lot, also from the roof canopies um, of the carports and the new roof um, of the new building. The parking lot and drive will be uh, managed via um, subsurface systems that you can see under the parking lots. Um, there is reasonably high groundwater out there, so we have a very shallow system, but um, because of the existing development on site, um, you know, our requirements to hold back, um, you know, a, a lot of water is, is, is decreased a little bit. One of the things we did need to provide is an emergency overflow, um, and so this is where we worked with the city and Smith College to propose a, an emergency overflow which will connect into Fruit Street um, underneath the existing carriage road on the Smith College property. They've got some draft, uh, draft uh, easement language in front of them now that they're reviewing, but um, all indications are now that the, that the college and, and the board will have no issues with, with um, this connection and or the boardwalk. Um, additionally, one of the one of the challenges with this site is, that, is there's an existing sanitary main that uh, collects uh, sewage from Dewey Court, uh, from South Street all the way south, all of Dewey Court. It uh, enters into a manhole in the back of the property, you can see um, in this back corner, and then heads east at 90 degrees to a connection in Fruit Street. Uh, this is a six inch line that runs under the isolated wetland in this location right here. Um, this image was taken from um, a, a video scope that we did uh, earlier this year to determine the, um, the viability of reusing that, that, that line. And what we discovered is that at roughly this location right here, in the corner of the site, there's a break and a change in materials. It's, it interestingly coincides with the fact that that wetland, that isolated wetland, collects runoff during the heavier storms coming down that carriage road. It gets to the bottom of the hill right above that break and then all the water disappears. Um, the adjacent neighbor downhill on Fruit Street um, said that it has overflowed occasionally over the years, but typically most of that water that can be seen you know, running down there disappears. So the expectation is that all of that is going into the sewer line right now because there's nowhere else for it to go. Uh, part of this project, and then working with DPW, acknowledge the fact that we need to replace that line. Um, replacing it in its existing location uh, wasn't a, a recommendation of ours primarily because it passes below a lot of the mature trees on site. It also runs through um, a good portion of that isolated wetland, which would mean we'd have to dig up almost that entire wetland to replace that line, uh, even though it's allowed as a limited project. Uh, so the proposal was to dovetail the drainage work with the sanitary line replacement and what we're proposing to do is run that in a single easement and trench <coughs> down that gravel carriage road um, with a new line um, to Fruit Street, to a new connection in Fruit Street um, with all the necessary easements and requirements of DPW who currently have no right to enter that property and maintain that line now. Um, so this, uh, this is certainly going to be a veteran for that sanitary line, um, and we did receive comments and have worked uh, closely with DPW um, through this whole process, and um, in support of the comments, I think um, they are generally in agreement with, um, with the proposal. Um, obviously, the new building, new infrastructure will tie into, into those, um, so Food Street being the ultimate destination for, um, for sanitary emergency stormwater overflow. Um, snow storage, we've got a fair amount of space on site to, to uh, you know, manage the typical snowstorms. Um, the space to the north, uh, above the carports really, will be, uh, will be available to take uh, you know, any snow fall or, or um, 
runoff or lack of better terms um, from the car course. This is snow that would otherwise have to be you know, plowed and um, dealt with and managed accordingly. So we felt it was appropriate to indicate those areas. Again, there's there's ample area in this open space and in, in some of the smaller areas along paths and around patios. Um, as with any other project um, in in New England, really, if the snowfall and snowstorm exceeds the ability of the site to, to handle that snow, then it needs to simply be trucked off site um, to allow for the site to function correctly. I don't think that's any different than any other project, but there is um, you know this, there is ample space on site to at least accommodate. Um, the typical snowstorm during a, during an average winter. Um, planting. So this site, um, this site obviously is heavily wooded, and, and it is one of the key characteristics that really um, that really defines this site. Um, there's there's approximately 37 trees on site that are all 20 inches in caliber and larger, so it would be subject to the bylaw. There's a host of other trees on there as well that are below that 20 inch caliper that um, weren't noted on the survey. We really were just focused on the on the um, on the specimen trees. And so of those 37, um, we worked really hard to design a site that minimized impacts of the existing trees. So of those 37, there's only two that we're proposing to remove. Um, one is in this corner. There's a large tulip tree that sort of sits out in the lawn a little bit. Um, that one needs to come down. There is another one up along this northerly property line, also a, a tall tulip tree. Um, we did have an arborist um, go out there and, and provide an assessment as to the health of those trees and the potential impact of this project on those. Um, that particular tree, um, he did note, is, is pretty heavily damaged. If you look up, um, look up the trunk about 30 feet, the, the core of the trunk from about 30 feet upwards is completely hollow, um, and it's it's about a 40 inch diameter tree. So there was real concern that that tree could present a real hazard to you know any of the existing properties as it stands, and also the proposed development just with wind throw and the potential for that tree to snap. So we are proposing to take that one down. Again, we included it in our calculations despite um, its its recommendation to remove it. Um, other trees that we are Close to, particularly with the uh, carports, as Charles will, Charles will speak to later, um, we have designed those carports to, to utilize um, piers and grade beams to minimize uh, foundation um, and footing disturbance along that edge. So those piers can be placed at, at uh, you know, intervals um, to accommodate the, the tree roots, and grade beam will be simply be placed on that to minimize the excavation needs under those roots. Um, all of the existing drive that's there now will remain. Um, if anything, we're picking up a few inches to make sure the drainage goes to where it needs to, but um, we're really not anticipating to do any heavy excavation within, um, you know, within most of the tree roots of those trees. Obviously, there's a little bit of utility work to do, but we've tried to locate those as far outside the, the root zones as possible. Um, Again, with respect to planting and some other elements, um, we've we've really tried to um, you know highlight the the wooded nature of the site. Um, we don't have room for a lot of uh, new trees because it is so heavily wooded. So it's a lot of understory trees and uh, perennial and rain garden vegetation. Um, we've got um, again in the open space a combination of grills, and picnic tables. Uh, we've got a Goshen stone seat wall to help. Um, to help um, just sort of augment that area, and then a, a boardwalk similar to this image crossing the wetland, um, the isolated wetland to the travel path to the south. Um, and then lastly, traffic. Um, and I understand that, you know, as Ben pointed out, um, you know, is it a major concern? Um, we also share the same concern. Right now, um, South Street is, is a heavy, heavily traveled intersection. Um, there were reports, traffic studies done back in 2006 or so that estimated that there were roughly 20,000 vehicle trips a day on South Street. This project increases um, the traffic on Dewey Court by, I think, about 14 uh, vehicle trips during the peak hours. Um, so again, in the, in, in the overall context of um, impacts to that intersection is really negligible. There's a um, driving uh, eastbound on South Street for the center of town. Um, there is a 
Um, the line closest to the median is a is a straight through uh, travel lane. The lane on the outside is a right turn lane. Uh, understandably, when the signal is red and there's a heavy volume of traffic, traffic will back up there, preventing vehicles from you know pulling out of Dewey Court, whether it's left, right, or trying to go straight into town. Um, Again, this will add, you know, 14 vehicle trips um, potentially um, to do court during the peak hours, and in in the context of the overall traffic impacts, that intersection is, is <coughs> negligible. Um, we are providing additional spaces on site uh, for traffic and or for, for vehicles, and as, as Ben pointed out, there is public parking available on on Dewey court. Um, and I think with that, I just want to highlight a couple of the other um, compliance standards with the URC um, zone in that parking is hidden and screened um, as required that the project is, is including uh, new landscaping, new sidewalks, drainage, and utility infrastructure to benefit the public as well as performing uh, low impact development um, standards and, and elements. Um, we've worked really hard um, to maintain as much of the existing vegetation and resources that are there um, and uh, have maintained the pedestrian connection that currently exists to the site, whether it's, it's public or private um, land, uh, park space is being provided, and then um, again, 80% of the units in the, in the new building are, are less than uh, 1,200 square feet um, versus 25% that are required by zoning. So, um, and I'll turn it over to Charles for a uh, quick review of the, of the building. Thanks, Jeff. I'm Charles Roberts from Human Design. Um, thanks for being here tonight. Um, ben and Jeff have really done a good job of, of saying most of uh, uh, the important parts of the project. I'm going to go through and talk quickly about the architecture and, Could you sort of, speak up? and, and how the, and how the design um, evolved. So when I first when I first entered into the site, it's this beautiful kind of wooded enclave, and, and the thought was, how do we fit a building in here that makes sense? How do we reduce the impact of the car on the site? How do we respect the neighbors in a way that allows the cars to circulate around the site, and, and uh, at the same time, you know, pr pr give them privacy and, and also serve the site well. So the, so the first move was to kind of keep the cars to the north and then shield them. Um, from the neighbors to the carports along the, that northern boundary. <clears throat> and the second part was just thinking about what, you know, what's the building, what's the shape of the building, how's it gonna fit in on the site. We have this amazing tree canopy, we have a we have a wetland boundary along to the south, and, and how does the building kind of nestle in there and what's the balance between the size of the, of the building, the number of units, the number of cars we can really fit on the site practically. And a lot of you know thinking and drawing and sort of analysis led us led us to this balance of 15 units and 23 spaces uh, as, as being what really felt like the site could sustain. Um, the, the, the footprint of the building itself, um, as you can see, is it's, it's kind of a, a, of a fractured form that uh, that uh, that two two shapes that have the that have the uh, the apartments in them and then the uh, the circulation spine down the middle which comes from the entry of the site and then down to a rear egress from the south, which ties into the, into the footpath. And so we, by, by taking the, the building shape and taking what is essentially a three-story apartment block building and, and fracturing it into these two forms with circulation down the middle, there's a lot to actually really break up the, uh, the, the form of the building and, and create a massing and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a character that, that really is uh, it's a pocket of the, of the natural wooded landscape. <coughs> Um, the other thing that's kind of neat when you when you fracture the, the geometry like this, you end up with five corners on what's essentially a rectangular um, building. So each of the units has a, has the, uh, the the primary living space, kitchen, dining, living um, on an open on an open corner with light coming in from two sides. Um, each ground floor unit has uh, has a private terrace or or patio, and then uh, and then there's uh, decks on units uh, up above on the second floor. So again, the green units are the, are the two bedrooms, the gray units you see in the plan are the one bedrooms, and then the, uh, the four bedrooms tucked in there in the upper, upper left corner. Um, the, I've got a few views just kind of cobbling around the building, just kind of give you a sense of, of, of the form and the shape and how it's integrated in the landscape. This is, as you, this is the view as you come in directly into the entry from Dewey Court, so you see the carports off to the right. Uh, uh, the parking area again between the building and, and the carports themselves. 
and you're drawn into that, that main entry piece in the building and it kind of helps give you a sense of, of uh, this, is, this is some more shot. And so as, as we sort of rotate around, this is this is looking from the uh, from the I guess the eastern the east parking area. So as, you, as you're circling around the existing house, <coughs> tree there in the middle, and then and then again how the the, the, the way that the way the massing of the building works helps to uh, to break those two primary forms of the apartments down around the circulation core. Um, this is just again circling around the uh, the driveway cul-de-sac, giving you views of the. Uh, of, of, the, of the, the forms of the building. This is a view towards the entry. You can see there's a, a, a fenced-in garden area on that one unit there, that one one bedroom. And you can see how the uh, the balconies up above stack over that. And um, <coughs> the, so the, the materials are going to be fiber cement, uh, the lap siding and panel siding. You may use some metal where you're seeing that gray uh, color there. We're, we're sort of still experimenting around with some of the uh, uh, material choices. Um, but uh, the idea is to kind of take the, the materials um, and use them in a way to articulate the shapes and the forms of the building. So again, it helps break down the scale of the building and, and, and give it interest and in, in, in some beauty. This is around the back of the building. So you, the, that, that gray form in the middle is the back, the back egress there. There will be a path that winds out from that and then ties into the, uh, into the, uh, the, the carriage path uh, on the Smith <coughs> These are just some overall views to kind of give you some context of, of, of this building and the scale of it relative to the existing house and, and uh, trying to give, give a, you know, create a sense of how the building really is tucked into the, the natural wooded landscape. Um, these are just some straight on elevations so you can clearly see the delineation of the materials and forms and how the how different kind of colors and, and material patterns are going to help um, Give the building some character and, uh, and, and scale. Uh, this is a building section, so it's three floors on the uh, on the southern uh, southern edge of the building. We, the, the gray drops off and up off, off enough that we can get a basement. So there's actually a, a fourth uh, underground basement, below, the, uh, below gray basement. On the Louder, please, back here. There's a um, uh, a basement on the base. There's a basement underneath the first floor. Um, sorry about that. This is this is kind of hard to see, but this is the carport, um, and as, as Jeff mentioned, uh, the, uh, the the northern edge of that carport is going to be framed on on piles and great beams, so we can work that in between the, the root systems of the existing trees and minimize any disruption to uh, the trees along that edge of the property. And uh, with that, I'll close it. Thank you. Did you speak up questions? Uh, this is a time for our planning board members to ask any specific technical questions of the presenters. Uh, so we are not yet moving into our board discussion or deliberations, but uh, do members of the planning board have any specific technical questions about the layout sheets and the, the plan sheets that we have all reviewed? Just a quick question, Jeff. Uh, trash, remove all the trash bins or Yes, so the on the Location of the existing garage now. Um, back up. Um, so the existing garage sits at the far eastern edge of the site. So that location will be will be the location for the new dumpster enclosure and every site. Okay. Thank you. And Jeff, uh, I saw um, plans for an elevator. Um, yes. As well. So is. The building itself ADA accessible? Is that I believe, yes. I, yeah, so uh, um, the, the entire building um, fits the definition of group one apartments, which are which is the initial threshold. Because it's under 20 units, we don't have to have a, a, a group two unit, but they all they are all accessible and designed to those standards. Thank you. I guess I'll just give any questions from zoning board members. Um, you maintaining the existing width of the pavement at the entrance? Yes. And is um, you know, the radius of that 
turnaround around that tree big enough for a fire truck? We did. We did meet with the fire chief and um, review reviewed the turning radius and the vehicles that we need to get in here were satisfied with what we have. Um, the uh, carports, which way do they drain? So the roof sheds to the north. So we've got on the back side, we've got, a, we've got an infiltration trench on that back side, a stone infiltration trench um, to deal with the runoff. Um, those tied to a rain garden. There is a 12, 10 to 12 foot distance um, per setback you know, to the property line. So that will be a, an area that will include stone trench and then some additional vegetation um, and for that, screening. And then that gets to the storm drainage <coughs> yes. after that. Correct. Okay. Pipes would go in the carports? Pipes are in the carports, correct. There's storage space behind each of, each of the, the spaces, yes. In terms of like snowstorms, <coughs> the snow is accumulating on the high of the carport. So the idea, the thought process being that any snow that accumulates on those roofs will slide off or be pushed off to the north um, into that, you know, the, the infiltration trench that I was just describing. So that's that's an area that you know we would utilize if the carports weren't there for snow storage if they were to plow that, um, you know, plow that parking lot. But we don't need to plow the parking lot because it will be covered. So that area. Um, so that area to the north is available for any snow that lands on these roofs. So it means that a little truck can come behind from behind him. No, no, that would be snow simply just sliding off and, and or being pushed off the roofs. Um, if there's you know a huge snow storm event, there'll be piles that'll have to be you know trucked off and, and you know picked up and trucked off. Neighbor, the neighbor property. Uh, is there any housing room with memory walk over there? there there's a two-family house just to the north of that, um, separated from the property line probably by another 12 or 10 feet. Um, so we don't anticipate that there'll be any any major issues. Excess of the neighbors of the snow. Yeah, I, I mean, there's that, that 12 feet there should accommodate you know a fair amount of snow off those roofs. It, again, it's only. You're, it's only an 18 foot depth that we're that we're going to go. Uh, could you just touch on again because it seems like a, a logical concern that others may have mm -hmm. the impact on traffic going on and off South Street to Dewey Court yeah you, you said something about and again our, our board doesn't have the expertise of the planning board but it does relate to the impact on the neighborhood yeah. Um, you said something about four, an addition of 14 cars. So there's our, our traffic impact statement estimates based on IDE standards that this development will increase um, the peak hour trips by 14 vehicles during the peak hour. Um, right now, again, there's there's 42 bedrooms, nine um, nine homes, a variety of, of single to three family homes on Dewey Court now. So. It would be um, this project would add addition, an additional, you know, 14 estimated trips per hour um, in the worst case scenario. And so, really, how that what that translates to is, um, and again, where I understand the major concerns are, is, is exiting Dewey Court onto South Street. And so, as I pointed out, right now, during um, during heavy traffic volumes, when traffic is backed up at that intersection, or where there aren't gaps in those vehicles sufficient enough for vehicles turning out of Dewey Court to, you know, particularly make a left turn or um, or trying to, get, trying to get into that center lane to drive straight into town, it's difficult to get off, get, get through those those lanes of traffic if traffic is backed up or, or is headed. And so that's a situation now that exists. It's, like I said, um, it's probably a D or an F uh, level of service intersection. Um, based on the, the turning movements and the gaps that are available coming out of, of Dewey Court. Um, 14 vehicle trips um, at, a, at a peak hour is not going to change the, the relative um, you know, condition or... Um, um, to the function of that intersection. 14 vehicle trips over a, a road that handles, again, in 2006, some 20,000 vehicle trips. Um, 
20, in what period? 20,000. 20,000 is uh, average daily trends. Average daily trends. Yeah. 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 Excuse me. Uh, thank you. Uh, we will be opening up the floor to comments from the public. <coughs> Sure. Um, <clears throat> so the pedestrian access to uh, to the um, plot, there's a sidewalk on the southern side. And here on seat L300, the kind of <clears throat> sidewalk comes in and just drops right off in the driveway. And so that, yep. Even some of our visuals showed pedestrians walking in the driveway. I wonder if there's a way that you can do something with that. So um, right now, that this large tree that sits at the end of Dewey Court is, is for the most part, taking up that entire sidewalk. Um, you really can't get by that tree on. There is a side, there are remnants of a sidewalk there. Um, the, the tree roots and, and the, the scale of that tree have really uprooted all of that existing sidewalk. Um, we are proposing to pick up where the property line um, property line is to bring pedestrians into the site um, and again trying to connect them with the the informal path really that that you know that we're we're working to retain through the site just as a means of, of convenience um, for, for the pedestrians now it's again it's not a requirement um, because again it's, it's really trying to invite public into the center of a, of, of a private site and so there was some conversation about it but we felt that that was a, an important enough connection and amenity that we wanted to try and, and retain that as much as much as possible um, it wasn't possible to get a sidewalk to connect all the way around to that in some fashion so i would <coughs> suggest later that the applicant hold hold your comment okay. yes we will be talking about it during our discussion okay um, who maintains, you talked about a boardwalk for the pathway, which is great to the Smith College um, pathway. Who maintains the infrastructure around walkways and boardwalks? Is it an association? Is it so any of the walks or infrastructure is part of this project, including the, the boardwalk and, and path through the site would be maintained by, by the developer of the association um, as, part of that, um, as part of that complex. Um, there will be a, a maintenance agreement, um, I'm sure, with the city and Smith College um, during, um, you know, when we finalize the easement language for the utility infrastructure. But Smith right now is the one that maintains that, that carriage road that continues up to the child, um, the child learning center. So I'll just admit, I'm not sure what's an appropriate question to ask now and what we're going to so, talk about later. clarification from the applicant about yeah. things that you have read that will help inform our discussion, that's fine right now. Um, any deliberations that we're going to have based on what we hear both from the public and the applicant, save it for once we close the public comment period. So if you need clarification about something that you see that only the applicant can provide, this would be the time to ask. But we're not closing the public hearing. We're going to close the we're public hear comment. We're going to public in so just a moment. We'll have a chance to have the presenters still respond to our questions during that open hearing. Yes. <coughs> but, okay. what, but we will be closing the public comment period right. before right. we That's have fine. our discussion. So right. once we do close that, you will not have access to, to Jeff anymore. No. Okay. No, I'm sorry. The public comment period is closed, but uh, not the public hearing. We'll still have access to Jeff. No, we will not. Once you put <coughs> the public, you have to close the public hearing. Once we close the public hearing and have our discussion, you won't be able to, to ask Jeff things. Right, but we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that until after we hear from the public, and you may have a few additional questions right, for the applicant. Okay. So right, okay. that's fine. Right. Yep. 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 This isn't the last opportunity that he'll be at that podium, probably. Do you have any other questions concerns? Is the zoning, zoning board folks have? So we are ready to open up um, the, the public comment period, and I want to make a couple of statements for you all before you get up um, and make those comments. And just explain what is a little bit different for those who've never been to a planning board hearing or a zoning board hearing, uh, what the parameters are of our public comment period. The purpose of the public comment period at this hearing is to provide information to the board, or in this case, boards, um, that will help inform our deliberations about this particular application. 
the public comment period during a planning board hearing is not the same as an open community forum. I understand the developer has already had a, a neighborhood meeting of that kind. Uh, this public comment period, again, gives us an opportunity to gather information that we'll consider during our discussion period. Uh, <coughs> this particular type of meeting, the public comment period, is not a dialogue between members of the public and the developer, and it's not a dialogue between members of the public and the board members that are here. Um, you know, all of the members of the board that are here, um, I can speak only for planning, but I will also assume zoning, you know, to whatever degree, have seen and read all the pieces of correspondence that have come in, both in support of and in opposition to this project. So we are asking that uh, you not read any letters that you have already submitted um, at the podium. They have already been entered into the record and have been uh, added to our list of issues that we will consider when we move to our deliberations. Um, during this period, we also ask that only new comments and issues be raised. I will recap the issues that we've received thus far. Uh, and it's not necessary for multiple members of the public to um, come up to the podium to agree with an issue that has already been raised. Um, again, once an issue is sort of delineated for us to discuss, we will be discussing it during our deliberation period. So um, if it's included in the recap, we will go over it. Uh, and I will respectfully ask that those folks who are repeating issues that have already been raised to refrain from commenting on them. Uh, additionally, we're going to ask that members of the public keep their comments to no more than three minutes, and that's consistent with how the City Council runs its meetings. Carolyn is going to keep time for us, uh, so again, don't be alarmed or surprised if she lets us know that, that those three minutes have expired. Um, finally, one last note, having read the application extensively, visited the site, um, and having read all the letters that were sent in to the Office of Planning and Sustainability, to the Ward 3 City Councilor, to the Mayor. Um, I, I understand that there are a lot of strong feelings um, in the community about this project. I don't anticipate that everybody here will leave an agreement, um, but we do expect civil discourse. So that means please refrain from things like clapping, cheering, making faces, speaking out of turn, um, any other disruptive activities. Um, you know, again, this is this is your opportunity to ensure that our discussion is as complete and comprehensive as possible, and that's the most important thing. Um, I will uh, at this time summarize the issues that we have received and that we will consider after we hear from members of the public, and then I'll answer your question in just a moment. Um, so we did receive, uh, I think the total number is up to 30. Um, different letters from either individuals or groups of individuals uh, who either are abutters or in the neighborhood or are residents of the city of Northampton more generally. Um, and the issues that, um, that came up and that we will be discussing are sufficiency of parking related to the size of the development, removal and replacement of significant trees, traffic impact on Dewey Court South Street intersection, use of the existing house as a community space for residents, and sufficiency of the water main. That last item has been discussed um, by the applicant, so um, we may not have a lot to say about it when we get to that point, but that was something that was raised by, uh, by some people in there. So those are, are the current sort of list of issues that are on our list. Um, and at this time, we welcome folks to come up to the podium and tell us uh, and I'm going to answer her one question before you do that. Uh, we'll ask for your name and your address, and again, we'll ask you to, to speak loudly and speak to the board. And ma'am, you have a question? Can you still submit in writing? That's a great question, which I don't know the answer. I mean, sure, or just make your comment publicly, it's the same. It has the same effect. So if you would have to, can we, is there a deadline to when we can submit in writing? So that maybe it alleviates these many minutes that I'm sure here for verbal. Well, so our, you know, tonight is our hearing. So, you know, I would say that, that in order for us to effectively consider what you might put in writing at this time, you know, I don't think that, that 
you, in order to submit something in writing, it would go to the Office of Planning and Sustainability and then go into a public filing cabinet that would then be disseminated to all of us and we'd have to read it. And so I think probably in the interest of ensuring that what would be in your statement is delivered to us, I would encourage you to, you know, to either read that statement if it's not been submitted and it's substantially unique, um, or if you do submit it, you know, you, you can't take any comment after you close the hearing. Right. So if tonight you close the hearing, right. then it effectively it does not be is right. not entered into the record. Right. Mm -hmm. So in order for it to be entered into the record, you know, publicly for us to consider, then I would encourage you to do it. Early. Unless you don't close the public comment period. Right. We very we we may. Um, you know that's that's a. a Thank you. Yes, the procedural question. I've been asked to present for my uh, neighbor and friend who's sight impaired, uh -huh. so I'd be presenting for her and also for myself and my husband. So you get six minutes. <laughs> and <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't get two six other minutes, people. But, uh, I have four letters. I'll well, summarize them very. I'll do this fast. Oh, if they're letter, are they letters that have already been submitted to no. us? No. Okay. All right. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And I think there's... Sir, do you want to be our first commenter? Uh, I'm going for it, yeah. Great. <laughs> Again, your name and your address, please. My name is John Farina. I uh, live at 24 Dewey Court. Great. I've been there with my wife for a little over three years now, expecting our first child in a few months. Um, so Dewey Court's currently a nice, quiet uh, block. Very charming. This proposed, uh, proposed project would change that. Uh, the developers claim that there that won't be an eyesore, that there's shrubbery uh, blocking it. That's true for about six months of the year. Then the other six months you see right through all that uh, green that you see right now. Um, over, traffic overflow has been, been cited. Uh, I, I feel that the developers are minimizing the traffic impact by using the number 14 out of 20,000 trips down South Street. The fact is 30 bedrooms being added to the block on 42 bedrooms that are currently there, it's almost doubling the size of the traffic on the block. Uh, every day when I make a left from South Street onto Dewey Court, I hold my breath that the car behind me is going to stop. Um, 14 cars during rush hour, that, that's a big deal. Um, if traffic's going up there. Uh, and we will be discussing the traffic impact. Okay. Uh, the developers claim that they're providing more parking than necessary. I simply don't believe that. These are luxury uh, apartments. The People that are living there are going to have cars. There's 30 bedrooms. I just don't buy the 23 parking spots. Is enough parking to not cause a ton of overflow parking onto the street? Uh, there was a situation on the block that an ambulance couldn't get down the street, and a person needed to be gurneyed down the block by hand. Uh, I find it hard to believe that I would be scared if a fire happened on that block. That the fire truck's going to get down there. Uh, the last two days at 7:30 in the morning, they were treating mobile trucks, a bunch of machinery outside. I'm just concerned about the, the flow of. Uh, construction equipment down the block, I, I, it can't fit. Um, it, it, it's a safety concern, uh, so yeah, those, those are my comments. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. 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 Elizabeth Dougal, 3 Dewey Court. And I am Susan McCreary, I'm visually impaired. My husband Michael and I have lived at our house on Dewey Court and owned it for the last 23 years. That's just going to read my first. So she presents this to the planning board. I want to make it clear that I am pro-responsible infill at 34 Dewey Court. So far, the city has not done the diligence for everyone involved. Here are the pictures before and after of the view from my backyard. It is evident that the proposed new building looms over 26 Dewey Court. Thus, I have lost my backyard privacy. Please refer to Northampton Zoning Ordinance 350-10.1. Special permits as a developer infringes on my right to privacy. Lynn Kreb, your mechanical engineer, has written a letter also for you. She's the owner of the building that I live in at 3 Dewey Court. Have her letter here to review the pictures and your modifications. Everyone coming and going from South Street out to Dewey and vice versa are aware of the hazardous driving conditions. I was a passenger in a car accident at this intersection. Others in the neighborhood have been as well. Northampton Police Department accident report for five years states six reported accidents. A number of accidents go unreported to NBD. People pull over and exchange paperwork themselves. As a pedestrian and a vis visually impaired person, crossing at the crosswalk at this corner is just as hazardous. Drivers have a difficult time engaging the traffic, never mind the pedestrian or cyclist trying to cross. Please refer to Northampton Zoning Ordinances 
10.2. Why has the city not demanded an independent traffic study? In good conscience, I do not know how the planning board can approve this existing project without an independent traffic study. It's not about anti-infill, but rather responsible infill and safety. This is not the proposal, the proposed infill the city presented to, tax, to taxpayers in 2014. I urge you to vote no on this project as is proposed, and thank you. Thank you. What are the rules? Yeah. Yeah. Which one? Uh, oh, uh, Chelsea was sorry. asking Carolyn yeah, okay, sorry. for an independent traffic study. So the, the engineer, um, uh, site engineer uh, from Berkshire Design put together a traffic wow. analysis. They did not do um, a full blown traffic study based on the fact that I mean, there's information up? stating that. Um, by doing that, the same result would uh, appear, essentially, that the issue is that it's the background traffic on South Street um, and that the level of service would not drop, which is the standard in the zoning for requiring mitigations if your project drops a level of service. Okay. Okay, what I have is a letter from Lynn Cravier, who's my landlady and her, and her wife, which actually goes into the background of take doing these pictures and her technical expertise in doing so. Um, I'm Lynn Crabier, I'm a mechanical engineer with expertise in three-dimensional computer-aided drafting, CAD, and two-dimensional graphic applications. To create the images of the yards on my Dewey Court neighbors, I use graphic applications to import images of photos of the backyards of 14 and 22 Dewey Court. Remove vegetation from the yard images based on the proposed changes to trees in the proposal of 34 Dewey Court. Copy images of the proposed buildings from the attached document, 34 Dewey Court, ZBA, Site Plans, PDF. Render orthogonal images of the building facades. Combine the updated yard and building images. As of the document provided by Kuhn and Riddle Architects, the views are approximations of how the pro final project will appear and are not necessarily to escape dimensionally with the existing landscape elements. My wife, G. Watt, and I live at 3 Dewey Court. We lived there from July. 87 to July 2013, we never reside, reside at 37 Lyman Road in Framingham, Mass, and rent out the two apartments to our, in our Dewey Court property. Both of all of the tenants are here today. We hope to return to Dewey Court and to live there through our retirement years. Thank you, Lynn Crevier. Thank you. Am I good? Yes. Okay. And you have one more letter? I have two more, actually. Okay, this is Elizabeth Dougal, myself, and Robert McLaughlin, my husband, to the planning board opposition to 34 Dewey Court. Special permit application dated July 8, 2019. We presently reside at 3 Dewey Court, renting the second floor. We are both actively practicing attorneys to come before you today, as much as concerned citizens of Northampton, as members of the legal community. The intersection of Dewey Court and South Street is already terribly dangerous. Entering Dewey Court from downtown requires a sharp left turn in the middle of traffic, waiting at the light of South Street and Old South Street. This situation is already unacceptable. It will be exacerbated by any additional development on Dewey Court. South Street, or Route 10, as it also is called, is a frequent route, new, to and from Cooley Dickinson Hospital and the police and fire departments. Emergency vehicles that take this route regularly will further be slowed by additional traffic from a Dewey Court development. Practically every night, every night, and I, I'd like to have the traffic study updated from 2006, practically every night we have red and blue flashing lights on our apartment walls from these vehicles. The development proposal for Dewey Court, this was from the last meeting, admits to 100 additional rides every day. I've heard some different numbers, a little up more than that. 100 additional rides every day down this short street and into this dangerous and slow intersection, which certainly would not accommodate any increase whatsoever in the traffic volume. We are renters, not homeowners, on Dewey Court. When we first heard of the proposed development, a rental development coming in, we enthusiastically thought we might want to rent there eventually, especially because our landlady want to come back and live in our unit. <laughs> And if it was well done, it made sense, but this is not the case so far. In their very pretty pictures, I noticed many of them, and there were no cars in the pictures, bikers, pedestrians. I'd be more, it would be more compelling to me if there were some cars in those pretty pictures. <laughs> As for the homeowners on the street, the ne negative impact of poor development might certainly reduce their home equity. This reduction, in turn, reduces assessed values upon which city taxes are based. Less taxes from these homes won't be good for Northampton. I lived in Chicago for 10 years. I'm a, I'm a real estate, I'm a, 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 a state attorney. If you have trees on your property, the property is worth more value. If there's trees in the neighborhood, 
if you urbanize the street and bring traffic in, it lowers your property values. You're lowering e equity on all those 10 or 12 buildings on that street, lower assessed values, lower taxes for the city. We have done some research into the development proposed documents. Certain irregularities in them trouble us greatly and should be investigated by the appropriate authorities. You can contact me for more information, and I'll give you this letter with my. Can you specify that? If, is that an issue that you're three asking me to discuss? Or well, just I mean, it's so delicate that I feel hesitant to do it, but there was something about I mean, a payment, done it already, so <laughs> payments in lieu of traffic study in the development it's materials. Not a it was not a payment in lieu of the traffic study. They were required to make a payment in lieu of their incremental impact to the traffic in the network. So that's applicable to anyone who applies for a permit that triggers site plan. So the payment might go for a traffic study? No. It goes to address traffic safety. It goes into sort of a pot of money that then it globally addresses issues like um, issues that might arise with the, num the vehicle trips on South Street or safety at the intersection. So it, it's a contribution by the applicant for their um, portion of impact on the network. It doesn't seem like you can solve that problem by throwing dollars at it at the end of the street rather than a traffic study that might reduce the development proposed. Well, I mean, we're, we're going to discuss traffic impact. You know, we do have a long history of using those funds for transportation improvements throughout the city that, that do have impacts on well, safety and circulation. Um, and so it's certainly, it, uh, I just want to assure you that, that this is not the first time, you know, okay. this is a very common um, thing. I raise it, I brought raising to me, that's all. Yeah. And then also the Gottlieb's name was on the application as the applicant. There were former neighbors on the street. We were astounded to see that. They have sent us a letter saying that they divested of the property over a year ago, are shocked that their name has been lent to the applications and are distressed by it. And thirdly, there's something about the frontage. I don't quite understand the frontage issue. I can't talk, speak to it entirely. But plus, it was like frontage is acceptable plus or minus 15 feet on either end or something. Dewey Court is 27 feet wide. So you're supposed to have 50 feet of frontage. I, I just don't understand all the, all the relationships in, in that issue. But it should be looked into. And I have my last letter. Okay. Carolyn McDaniel, 97 South Street 1F, Northampton, Massachusetts, to the Planning Board, opposition to 34 Dewey Court Special Permit Application, dated July 8, 2019. I presently reside on South Street in Northampton, Mass, directly across from Dewey Court. I am also the owner of Convena Wine Bar at Thorns Marketplace. Almost every day throughout the year, I must cross South Street near Dewey Court to get to work. It goes by foot. Traffic is already so bad at this intersection that I already find crossing to be a daunting task. Should additional development occur on Dewey Court that exacerbates traffic at this corner, I despair of getting to work safely and promptly each day. As a Northampton business owner, I am opposed to the development in Dewey Court for another important reason. I understand the city's desire to infill. Many empty storefronts presently exist in the downtown area which detract from my business position. Shouldn't we be focused on filling in those empty urban spaces before we destroy irreplaceable green space in the city. Thank you for your attention. My concerns, Caroline McDaniel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. May I close this because I need the desk? For the chair, we need documents that Mrs. Denning is submitting. Um, well, so I believe we will be, um, I mean, we'll be able okay, to I'll start. Okay, I just need to have Okay. Thank you. Just put it down. Thank you. Hi. I'm Nancy Gelly. And you have submitted a, a letter to us. I have submitted a letter, and many of the items I've referred to a accident I had that was not called into the police, but uh, it was pretty hairy. So um, I agree with the developer that it should be F or D at best. Okay, um, so I am a direct abutter, and uh, what I'm going to be looking at this development will be the removal of some significant trees plus the backside of a carport. And uh, so, what uh, my friend is passing around here is some drawings that um, are reflect some analysis of the site plan here. Um, I, I hasten to say that um, not only am I a, a butter, I've been in the neighborhood six years, I've lived in Northampton 30 years, over three different times, keep coming back because I'm a city lover, I love infill, 
and I'm a landscape architect who does urban design as well as public housing. Uh, so I'm very familiar with this um, and, and positive toward it. So I, I think the most important drawing here is the one called Development Issues, in which, of which I put in yellow. Have you all received it? Any, you know, development Issues. So let's go on these. The existing cul-de-sac um, is substandard considerably, but according to city standards, city subdivision regulations that call for a 50-foot radius. Um, right now it's 24. It's 12 feet from the center of the circle to the edge of the curb and then another 12 feet on the road. I can barely drive around it as a private car. I, I drive a Nissan and I am very concerned about um, trash vehicles as well as emergency vehicles as it is. Um, trash vehicles have to back up and my neighbor has had to come and pick up our trash cans because they couldn't get through. Again, I just want to remind you, anything that was in your letter, okay, okay, fine. new items. Fine, okay. Proposed parking, um, it's a substan substandard aisle width, it's been shown as 20 feet, um, and I have documentation to show, if you'd like to see, that it really should be 24 feet. Um, and there is a lack of space for the two end units um, for any turnaround at all. So that will necessitate a four-point turn to get out of your parking space. Um, and as I say, the carport is facing its rear toward the butters, which I find quite rude. Mm -hmm. um, as for the proposed building, you will see that there is a blue line uh, uh, with uh, three dots. That indicates the end, the 50-foot wetlands protection zone. I'm not just talking about a buffer zone, which is 100 feet. So, as you look at this drawing, you see that um, part of the building, the whole building is, most of the building is within uh, the buffer zone, and a, even a portion of it, uh, just estimating the percentages, are in the protection zone, which is not something that should be done. Likewise, uh, the parking uh, area that is indicated in the yellow between the, uh, the buffer zone and the protection zone, so nine spaces are within the buffer zone, and part of the turnaround space is in the protection zone. And I, I just want to pause you for a moment at three minutes, so we, we will add discussion about the wetland buffer zone to our list of issues. Are there any other different issues than well, I Well, okay, mentioned? one thing that hasn't been talked about, we are concerned about the um, the use of the house for parties and the like because we don't believe there's enough parking. But let's look at the path, pedestrian path that has been shown to be great public humanity here. But if you look at this drawing that I've done, I have uh, done a, uh, an analysis of the grades of the, uh, of the uh, walkway. You see those, the pathway. The existing path, by the way, is at grade level. And what they are proposing is a pedestrian path, path that drops seven feet over 55 linear feet, which means 12 and a half percent slope. And just for your information, 5% is the maximum for not being a ramp. A ramp, the maximum is 8.33%. This is 12.5%. And also, as you see by the lines here, they are proposing grading within the, the wetland protection zone. And for the snow, I understand a little bit more clearly now about the infiltration, but I just found it hard to believe the configuration of a long, thin, cigar-shaped being for snow storage is really uh, a doable thing. I, my, my snow storage area is using the form of piles. So I know I'm out of time. Well, this is like an elevator speech. Additional, uh, no, I appreciate you raising those two additional issues, and we will add them to our discussion. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Bob Myers, and uh, I live at 25 Julie Court as well. So I'm the director of Butter and Property. Uh, I recently retired and I was had 45 years of experience in real estate finance and development. That, that's all I've done all my life. And I have some questions about the floor plate of the units. What we've heard the developers say is they're apartments. 
Well, there are all kinds of apartments. There are condominium apartments, luxury apartments. Some gentleman mentioned they oh, they're luxury apartments. Well, I've developed 5,000 units, and I've never seen a floor plate like this for a luxury apartment. What it does speak of are things like congregate housing, medical facilities, um, health care, uh, maybe extended living facilities. So the combination of the, those floor plates where you see in that one unit, like four bedroom unit, mm -hmm. <laughs> what, what person is going to rent a luxury apartment of that small size with four bedrooms and needs a full bath in each room? Mm -hmm. And a very small living room and a kitchenette area. Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> that's not the use that I perceive as a luxury apartment. And I have built a kind of house, and that's the way it's designed. We recently did an opiate treatment facility in Greenfield that I worked on, and that's a similar floor plate for some of the folks that I've given to. So I'm concerned that but they what sort is of- What's the specific concern about it? The specific concern is the nature of who might be occupying the building? Yes, because of this. It's also the density. Now, they, they, they use a euphemism about this and saying, oh, it's family units, but really the units are designed for multiple people to live in them but probably you're not related, okay? And if you have those units, you really have to look to not the number of apartments when you're talking about traffic and parking. You have to look as, at each unit as being a separate renter, okay? And that renter, very possibly, having separate needs for automobiles and traffic and so forth. So you, it, when you lump it in and say, if a plan board allows so many parking spaces per apartment, I think in this case, you have to look at the rooms, not the apartment. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, um, I'm Aaron Washington. Y'all can hear me in the back? Yeah. yeah. Great. So, um, I'm a resident of 72 Barrett Street. Um, don't live on Court Street. Or should I do it? Yeah, but just, and I'm also not like um, a part of a historical group that, you know, profited off a legacy of housing discrimination scarcity, so I really don't know how y'all weigh concerns, but this is, that comment is ridiculous to me. Northampton has a housing shortage, straight up. I know that your property values will go down, that's really sad for you, but look, people need to live here. You have all this economic opportunity in this area, and you're restricting it. This is part of the most segregated place in the nation. And y'all are going to sit here and tell me y'all are worried about 14 extra cars on that street, which is probably terrible. I believe you. But that's not going to change the fundamental issues. And it's shameful. Like, seriously, if you guys are concerned about the quality of your neighbors, please, there's a good old-fashioned way to do it. Put on a hood, run across, maybe no, that'll work. But, but, no, but for real, this is, look, zoning and planning have been used to discriminate against individuals for decades in this country. And you guys are going to sit here and say that you're concerned about the quality of the residents because there's too many bathrooms and a floor plan? Thank you. Thank you. Other comments from the public? Mm -hmm. um, my name is Luca Madden, and I live at 22 Dewey Court, and I'm a tenant there. Could you speak up? Yeah, um, my name is Luca Madden, I live at 22 Dewey Court, and I'm a tenant there. Um, hi, please. Sorry, just go back. <laughs> um, so, uh, contrary to that, I'm a renter. I have no vested interest in the value of the property. I would love welcome more affordable housing in Northampton. Um, the properties are currently priced out of my price range, um, and so the prices would most likely inflate our rental prices, um, thus pricing me out of my own neighborhood. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> if there aren't any other comments from the public, we will... There's a lot more. 
Strike while the iron is hot. If the podium's empty, come on up. Um, hello, uh, Ward 3 City Councilor Jim Nash. I'm going to make a statement about something that's already on your agenda because it promised these people that I would say it to you. I would like to see a traffic study um, as part of the looked into because of all of the traffic issues that have been mentioned. So. Um, just a point of clarification. So I understand that you do serve on the Transportation and Parking Committee of City Council. Is that the committee that would ask the city to invest in a traffic study? Normally, I mean, how is that? That's my understanding. Is that other traffic studies that have been carried out have been funded by the city by a recommendation? Yes. By your so committee? that is. Oh, so you want to talk about that? No. I'm uh, not so sure. uh, that that's that's actually uh, so. There's a process <laughs> where uh, neighborhoods can um, uh, uh, complete a petition to request that a traffic study be done on their neighborhood uh, in, on a particular um, street. Um, and that, um, but it, it's a process that is in need of review. Mm -hmm. And okay. so that there's, um, it would be a long time coming. There's many um, applications uh, sitting in the queue, um, some going back many years. So okay. I think in relationship to this project, it would be a very slow way to go. And, I, and I'm just clear, so I think, are you asking that um, the board not waive the requirement for signal or full traffic study and the and you are asking the board that um, a full traffic study be done instead of the narrative uh, if it, it's going beyond the narrative that was submitted yes i'm asking for a full traffic study which is what i believe people are asking for can i pass it like a, it seems like we're having this is a if this is a well, if it's a failing grade and you're adding 14 cars, cars, it's still a failing grade. So what's, it's just failing, so who cares? It's a tragedy waiting to Well, I get that it's a tragedy. I mean, there's lots of tragedies. That wasn't my so, no, no. So, so, <laughs> so, so I, I don't understand, I mean, is it really, we, we, I mean, I, I said the same thing when I pulled out, when I pulled out this afternoon, I was like, boy, this is a, so. Our, yes, our I think everybody who's pulled out of there said that. But I didn't, but honestly, I'm not sure that it would change. My, my feeling would be the same thing. Boy, this is sort of scary to pull out if there are 14 more cars. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure what the difference would be. Like, you, you understand what I'm saying? Like, what's, what, what is the point of doing something that we know already has to go through? Well, I, I think the point is to evaluate the impact of the project and the additional traffic and weigh it um, in relationship to the street there. So extra feeling. Hmm? So it's like extra feeling. Yeah, I, it could have been. You know, this, 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 you know, so. Um, I mean, no one's building a light. No one's going to build, you know, like those things aren't going to happen. Yes, but so your job as the planning board is to evaluate whether or not this, um, the, 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 the traffic impacts of this project on this street um, are, are going to be detrimental to um, the neighborhood there. You know, I, is it not going to function? You know, right. is it, yeah, is it 14 more or is it, is it the breaking point? Is it a hundred of them? Oh, and it's not fourteen. There's a point. Oh, there's a point. There's a point. There's a point. There's a point. In which all the traffic accumulates and just breaks down to the flow of traffic on the street. So maybe it would be profitable to put a traffic light somewhere on the street just to stop traffic so that people can safely get on and off. So a traffic impact statement would give that information. And, and I think that you're, what you're saying is something that we may discuss during our deliberation period, but also something that residents certainly have access to the City Council and the Transportation and Parking Committee to, to request those kinds of improvements right. that But I'm on the zoning board and I have very limited. Yeah, <laughs> I appreciate your comment. <laughs> Thank you. All right, that was my, any more questions? Thank you. <coughs> Hi, I'm Amy Ben Ezra. I live at 18 Dewey Court. I'm a renter, and uh, I lived in New York City for many decades. Um, the last place I lived had 
1,008 apartments. I don't have a problem with density. I don't have a problem with renters. I don't have a problem with unrelated adults living together. I think that it's unfair, however, to, set, to talk about this number of 14. Because if, in fact, you have more adults, you're going to have more cars. I mean, this is America. You can have cars. I live here. I move there because I want to walk to work. I happen to work in downtown Northampton. So does my husband. If I still worked in Springfield or wherever, I would be driving my car to work. I wouldn't have a choice, right? So it's disingenuous to think that everybody's going to walk everywhere because they have to go other places besides downtown Northampton. There are going to be more, more than 14 adults. Let's put it that way. There's going to be more than 14 adults in this place that has 30 bedrooms. So I think it's fair to assume there's going to be more cars than, than 14. Um, I assume these people have, have come and go through the day. People do different things. I assume they have visitors. I assume that they have family. They have parties. They have all the things that normal people do. The number that I had heard before from the developer was 100 trips a day. And um, I think that it's important to note that the fact that we are failing at that intersection, if that's a point of agreement or whatever, yes, when you have more cars, if you add many more trips, it isn't just it's still a, a D or it's still a zero. It's that many more opportunities for accidents and therefore that many more accidents. So, and I make fun of people around here who complain about traffic and talk about the traffic on the bridge. I mean, I live near the Triborough and the GW and stuff, and I think it's pretty silly. But I move to this intersection, and I come through the light to make my little left turn, and I realize that the cars coming behind me, are they just zipping around the curve because they just got through a light. They got a green. They're not expecting me to be stopping there. They think my turn signal is from the, turn, the original turn, not from the turning on to do report. So I'm not watching who's coming this way. I'm looking in my mirror to see if someone's going to whack me in the back and then to make my turn. Uh, I usually pull up onto the, that braided strip in the middle so, so that they have room to go around me if they're going too, too fast to stop. Okay, so. That's what I want to say about the danger, and it's more people that are impacted. I also want to say I am not against more density, and I want more housing, but who, who are the people who can pay $900 a month for a bedroom? And if it's a family, that's what it comes out to, like in a four bed, and the prices that I've heard for this apartment, and I'd love it if the developer spoke to this, but I'm hearing numbers like $3,000 and $3,600. And in a four-bedroom apartment, that's $900 bucks a head, right? Which is, as I understand it, the going rate for students to pay. And I don't have against the students. But let's be real about the cost, about who's going to be attracted to these particular apartments, what their needs are going to be, what the needs are going to be for police. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I have to, one other thing. I, since I moved, I'm already on um, I'm, when I moved in here just a few months ago, I had a delivery. And I said to the guy, delivery guy, Mr. Chuck, this is not a particularly huge truck. You can just go to that little turn at the bottom there, and you'll be able to get around that. Great. It took him 15 minutes to come around that circle. The circle is little. Go ahead and look at it. It's really little, and it's, I, it just boggles my mind to think that that is adequate. I want to see a good, adequate infill. Thank you. Other comments? Hi, um, I'm Anne-Marie Mojo. And Mark Mojo is also here. We're direct the butters of this project. Um, and we have at, read your letter that was submitted. Yes, yep, 24 to 26, and uh, also 22. Mm -hmm. um, so, right, we submitted our letter, so um, all, most of our concerns are in there. I just wanted to highlight one of the major concerns um, is, is the lack of frontage for the development that you spoke about a little bit earlier. Um, that 
it, it's the butt end of a dead end street, which is not considered legal frontage in Northampton. It's a change, this change from single family to multi family on the site with inadequate frontage is, is substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood, as we've heard for many different reasons, than the existing non conforming frontage. And if you look at 9.3b2, um, it mentions that's what is um, referred to for what you need to think about with the, with the um, inadequate uh, the, uh, being more detrimental, sorry, um, is that parking, there's a lot more parking required than what is. Um, currently required there as a single family house. That's one of the one of the issues on there. Um, we also, um, as you can see from the picture, have have what the view will be um, what it is now, and then what it will be for our ventures. We don't currently live there. Um, we hope for the future, but um, we have some wonderful people living there now. That is what um, the view sees and things will turn into for this project. Anything else, Mark? This is our house now. This is. Um, standing in the driveway looking at the woods that exist now. Uh, I'm sorry, but my my tenant John said that these, you know, the foliage drops in the winter time. But I don't care if you drill point uh, for the, these car points with little footings and stuff. You're going to lose all these trees. Uh, the roots are going to be damaged. They may stand for a few years. But I guarantee these roots will be damaged, and these trees will all be gone, hence creating this situation. Uh, it's going to be awful. Uh, I also want to, and I know I have said it before, this tree is 27 feet wide. It's, it's deceiving that it's 50 feet wide on the plant. Uh, and there is absolutely no way a fire truck could get around that cul-de-sac. We actually talked to the fire department as well. They didn't bring up anything about turning around in that uh, turnaround area that's on the property now. If they went into it, they would have to go into it and take an immediate right and hopefully fight the fire with their ladder truck at that point. And that's only one truck going in there. Uh, the other point I wanted to make was the snow storage area. At the end, where they're pushing the majority of the snow, uh, there's a tree there. Uh, a beautiful tree. That tree is going to get scuffed by plows, the roots of that tree, as well as, there's two of us, <laughs> as well as the uh, salt in the snow when it's pushed up there is going to drain into the roots yeah, of the tree. That was in your as well. letter, so we did read okay. that, and that is part okay. of our discussion of okay. the site. All right. Okay. No, go ahead. Right. So, are you, in? are you done? Yep. Okay. So, I just wanted to say that we're both lifelong residents of Northampton. Um, we love Northampton and um, are in favor of development um, as long as it's done appropriately and within our city regulations. And we just think this project is large. It's too large for the end of the street. We expect something there, look forward to something there, but not something to this scale, um, bringing in all the issues that we talked about tonight. Thank, Thank you. Very you. Much. Thank you. Hi, I'm going to bring this back up because I want to show you a couple of photographs that, okay, how do we get these things to talk to each other? Let's see. Um, we'll need your name and address. Sure, okay. I'll get it to you. Why don't I just get this in order now? There might be some problems because the power went down, so it disconnected. Rose Street. Um, I this morning went down to uh, the intersection just to take a few photographs of um, something that all of us are very intimate with, but it's more theoretical for you. So it's an opportunity to really drive it home um, the uh, the danger of this intersection. But I want to back up for a second and ask you all of you how many of you remember the um, the tragedy. 2012 when a pedestrian trying to cross South Street one block north of this near the Academy of Music was struck, was struck dead. Um, when, when that happened, I, I remember it intimately because my children at that time, ages 9 and 11, witnessed it on their way home from school. 
and they came home traumatized. So the difference between an F and an F minus is a DAC. And I, um, according to the news report um, from that, the trial, the cause of the accident was that the driver had, quote, moved into the right-hand lane designated for bicycle use, a common practice for vehicles approaching the intersection. So um, seven years later, that is still uh, a problem um, site. Cars still drive down the bike lane there. Um, and I know that I've contacted my counselor about it. The Transportation and Parking Commission has been alerted of it. But it hasn't changed. And um, I bring this issue up for two reasons. One is that, you know, sometimes a city has a really hard time addressing tricky ish, uh, traffic issues. And so instead of trying to um, solve it, we should try to prevent it. Um, or at least not exacerbate it. And that um, situation is so similar to what has happened, what happens on a regular basis at this double back-to-back -back intersection. So this was five minutes. This is just cars going uh, northbound. Um, so there's one picture, and you can see I circled where Dewey Court is. And then, so, okay. There's another, so two cars going into the bike lane. This is the bike lane. And then on the opposite side, you can see them back to back. So if you're trying to turn, let's say you're coming from downtown, and you know, Amy and some other people described how challenging it is to make that left, left turn into Dewey Court. So you think that you're only dealing with one, one, uh, one lane of cars coming in, but actually you've got this invisible lane that may or may not have a biker in it or a car. So it's, you know, you're just 14 cars in a given hour actually is a lot of cars. I mean, if you have them backing up or if you have, you know, it's a very, very impatient intersection. So the the, uh, the fabric from South Street is um, really challenging. All right, so that's the issue. So I, again, I echo everyone else, independent traffic study. I think it's really important. We'll be discussing that. Okay, the last thing I want to point out, and I've already talked about the trees, but I just want to point out one thing, I'm going to submit this to you, is that the two, um, the two trees that they described as the, the beautiful trees in the, in the front that they want to retain, um, Mark Mojo has mentioned that one of them, a lot of the snow um, storage is going to be up against them. Um, it's also a Noria maple, which is an invasive species, so it's not that interesting of a, of a tree to retain. Um, it's also, according to the Arborist report, um, proposed sewer line within five feet of the trunk. So um, I, that is questionable whether it'll, it'll survive. And the other one is the sugar maple. Um, judged in fair to good condition, actually in fair condition by our tree warden. And then the uh, Arbor's comments about that other tree is possible root damage from sewer line installation. So the idea of that they're, you're keeping this beautiful, you know, um, frontage of the, the um, abutters, we'll see essentially what they always have is, is probably not the case. Thank you. And I'll submit this for your consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other comments from the public? Um, one of the things that hasn't been brought up is we live on Lyman Road and we have all the traffic for Smith College. They have a huge dumping ground here, year round. This is in my letter, snow removal. All of the library, all of that gets dumped at the end of Lyman Road. The damage to our home is significant because of all the vibration. Our homes are so close to the road. Now, all of the people, you who live on Dewey Court, you all have to realize your houses are going to be shaken. You need to have somebody come in, look at your homes, assess the value of them now as far as damage goes, and then you need to turn around. When, when any of this project goes through, 
have them reassessed. I went to the city of Northampton, about three homes on Lyman Road. Some of my neighbors are here. They gave me the insurance company's name. The insurance company told me for the city of Northampton to go to my insurance company and have them subjugate to Northampton. First question out of my insurance adjuster's name was, why wouldn't the city take care of it? Why aren't their insurance companies taking care of it? I couldn't answer them. I said, he told me to tell you to subjugate. Well, finally, they just said they didn't want anything to do with it. They told me that, um, that basically, they call it, uh, how did you put it? Um, oh, over time. And just to clarify, damage this is damage overtime. to your home from traffic or from construction sure. projects? From construction vehicles that go up and down Lyman Road on a daily basis, whether it's a truck, um, a loader to go down there to push all the dirt and all the debris that's trucked down there. And we're not just talking dirt, snow, all the snow removal, trees are all pushed down there on that backpack. And my concern is, if, when I went, when I first started this out, I went to the DPW. And one of the things that they said to me when I said about where all these trucks were coming from, from Smith, the comment made to me was, well, we don't like to ruffle the feathers of Smith College. And I just looked at them. So I said, okay. I said, well, I'm a taxpayer. I need to have some some recourse here. So that's when they told me to come down to City Hall, which I did. And I just followed the whole procedure. And I got nowhere. We, we paid for the fixing of our porch. You know, when things start to shift and move, um, one of my neighbors, you know, how we have these nice columns in our homes. Well, all of a sudden, one of them's dropped over an inch. That's not normal wear and tear. Your homes are going to shake and vibrate. If you have lath and plaster walls, cracks are going to be there. Big time cracks. I have gaps. My doors don't shut properly anymore. I've got windows that don't shut properly anymore. That's shifting. And that's what has not been brought up. What is going to be the cause and effect of this project? And I think that needs to be determined. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have that for discussion. Thank you very much. Right under the wire. <laughs> yes, sir. Hello. My name is Barry Gruber. I moved to Northampton on June 13th. Um, I am just retired and I chose this community of all communities, even though none of my kids are here or anything, because um, I love Northampton. And I'm also very interested in politics. I live in 128 Brookside Circle in Florence. Um, so I'm nowhere near what's going on here, but I'm interested in government. My son is a city councilman in Rochester, New York. So I like to vicariously follow his career by inserting myself into government meetings. Um, and so I just, I, I want to make two comments. One of them is that I'm 66 years old. I've been around the block a few times. I've been to lots of meetings like this in Rochester, New York, for a group home for Alzheimer's patients. I've been, you know, there's always some project that is going to be constructed, and everybody always says, oh, what a great idea, as long as it's not in my backyard. Okay, and I will say that from what I know so little already, about North, Northampton, I looked for places to live. There is not, there are not a lot of options for people in Northampton at any pay, at any rent rate. Um, so, um, you know, the fact that we're going to, you know, that, that this argument about all these things, okay, it can be made anywhere about anything, and it's always the neighbors, and it's understandable, I'm not, I'm not criticizing it, it's understandable. No one wants to see their neighborhood change, whether it's for a good thing or for a bad thing. I, I've never been to a meeting that was different than this um, when it came to a plan. Um, no neighbor ever says, wow, that's great. So, so that's my first comment. My second comment is, and this I really don't understand, I'm going to be curious if I can follow it up somehow, 
95% of this are people talking about traffic problems in a place where there's already a bad traffic problem. No matter what you do in that property, whether you're building three apartments or 15 apartments, you're adding more traffic to what everybody's already said is a terrible situation. So instead of punishing someone who's trying to build something, why is no one putting traffic on the city? You've been living there for so long. Has anyone ever said, we need a traffic light here, or we need something? Instead of saying, no more development, no more cars, why not a traffic light? It's so bad, even without the development. That's all I got to say. Thank you very much. The traffic light is five feet away. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Crystal Ellis, and I live at 72 Barrett Street, and I just have a couple comments to say. I don't know if I can, is it okay with the rules to comment on something that somebody has already brought up? Yes, if it's something that you want for us to consider during consider. our deliberations. Okay. Yes. Um, so <laughs> it's already been brought up that... Um, the argument has been made that by creating this development, rent will increase significantly. Um, it'll just have that negative effect. Um, rent already is high in Northampton. I moved here six years ago from Seattle, Washington, and I have seen the effects of gentrification um, and how it affects the suburbs and how rent across the nation is way too high for people who have really good jobs. I have a really good job, and it is still very difficult for me to afford the rent in Northampton. So I used to live downtown, and when I was always looking for affordable, clean, um, and place good places to dwell, it was very difficult for me to actually find something that was suitable, that was reasonable, that was un un under 2000 for a one bedroom, which is crazy. It's absolutely insane. I mean, when you say who's going to rent a one bedroom for $900, people will do that. Pe there are houses that are multi multi-family homes where students that are coming from Smith who have very rich and affluent parents who will pay more than $900. So you will get unrelated people living in those places, but you will also price out people who are coming here to improve their lives and improve their, you know, their, 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 their career ideas, their, their, their career development, and are having to be priced out and having to commute out of Springfield and Chicopee and other places. So I, I just think, you know, you should really think about who is um, negatively affected and who really needs affordable housing. Um, one thing that I do want to raise is um, my, I'm concerned about the pricing, um, if it actually will be affordable housing. But regardless of the price of that, rent is going up. We know that um, across the board. Um, and then there's another point that someone said, why don't we develop the um, empty real estate on Main Street? Well, it's because there's um, <laughs> a certain number of people who own those that are pricing out people who are wanting to be small businesses and move into those real estate. So it's, there are two separate issues that it's one is about like a business versus a residential unit. So I don't think those two should be conflated. You can have both of them. They're just two separate issues. Um, I think I think that's my time. <laughs> and just a point of clarification for the public as well that you know this project, as described, is not uh, an affordable housing development. Capital A. This you know this developer is not leveraging the affordable housing tax credits like the lumber yard or Live 155. Um, it is a market rate development. However, one of the affordability strategies that is in many of the Northampton plans is that by keeping um, many of the one bedroom units um, and two bedroom units under 1,000 square feet, that they will be inherently cheaper, for lack of a better word, than, um, than much larger units. So there is not um, an expectation necessarily that all of the units being built are supposed to be affordable per se, this is a market rate development, um, but I think there is a, um, you know, there
there is an impact based on the, the size of many of the one two bedroom units in the development. Uh, so my name is Andrew Smith. Um, I live on 10 Myrtle Street, um, which is Ward 1. Can you speak up a little bit, please? Sure thing. Andrew Smith, uh, 10 Myrtle Street, Ward 1. I don't, I'm not in the butter to the project. I have become, I have become aware of the project. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in, in making statements in favor of infill development. Obviously, uh, in my, my course of talking to people around the city, one of the things that uh, people have said is that there are young people who work in the city who live in uh, Leverett or live in like, Belter Town who commute into the city, and they've said that they would love to have uh, a place to live that was affordable, that wasn't like a sun-sized housing unit with a wait list. And so I see this as a way of um, the city meeting the obligation of uh, providing housing that serves people who are not looking for single-family housing at this moment in time. So that's, that's a positive thing. Um, it seems very beneficial. Um, uh, I mean, obviously, when it comes to the climate impacts, when you have uh, housing, you have people that are commuting back and forth at great distances, and when the city has to maintain roads in order to keep these drivable, people complain about potholes. You know, then we have these like issues of we're, we're, in, we're, we're spreading our resources very thin and we're investing in outlying areas that increase our climate impact. So infill development is a positive thing from a climate impact standpoint because you're doing infill development, you're building housing in places where people can live and work or at least walk close to town, which reduces traffic impacts. So I think that, that's all good stuff. I think I'm, I'm in favor of that. Um, I think uh, one of the points that's been raised about some of the significant trees on the property, I think uh, that, that big tulip tree is like a, a very important piece of the landscape that probably should be preserved. It seems like oftentimes when you're doing these projects, the things that have to do with people, like nobody has an issue with, but the things that have to do with like infrastructure for cars, that's where we come from the problems. So I'm sure there's a way they can redesign the parking lot or actually do some cycling uh, amendments to accommodate some of the water significant trees. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out, if, if uh, really didn't point out, is that tulip tree is a, it's a southern species, so it's um, it's like when you think about like long-term mitigation for climate change or adaptation for climate change, that's a species that's going to do well in our, our the hot house people and have it in the future, right? Um, so, so that's good. We want to preserve that. Um, so yeah, so I'm sure there's a way to uh, do two things at the same time where you can build housing and preserve trees and uh, info development on balance is a, a net positive uh, from the climate change standpoint. So, you Thank you. Hi, I'm Sandra Navarro. I live at Nine Lyman Road. Um, so my Can you say that again? I'm sorry. I live on Nine Lyman Road, so just across. Um, my child also attends Fort Hill. We're really lucky um, to have him there. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about the wetland um, and that area and that canopy um, and how much um, over the course of the last three years um, that he's been with us, um, just the the projects that these students have been able to do in terms of bringing all these amazing insects that live in the wetlands, that they've seen foxes, they've had moths that look like um, pieces of wood, they've had all sorts of wonderful projects. And my concern is by disturbing that really precious ecosystem, what how that makes it impossible for those kinds of projects to happen. So that's my concern. Also, he spends a lot of time playing in the woods um, using the carriage patch. We, we, patch, we use it um, on a weekly basis, um, if not sometimes you know, with a three-year-old on a daily basis. Um, and so I just worry about the impact about you know, having this building there um, in, in a space that you know, he feels pretty free to move around in. So I worry about that. And I think that goes to a broader um, concern, which is, um, I'm a professor, my husband's a librarian. Um, it's not that we're like, um, we, we have really great professions, but we also had a big problem finding affordable housing when we moved here in terms of renting. And we do have a dog, and that was an absolute no. Um, when we uh, tried to secure places to live, um, also the affordability was a big issue for us. In the end, we ended up buying because it was actually cheaper than renting, and we managed to find this really great place for, for you know, right across from Fort Hill. Um, but I think talking about affordability is really important, especially when you have two professionals who can't afford to find a place to live. That's really significant, and I'm hearing that across the board. We um, obviously get faculty um, and young families who want to buy in Northampton, who can't afford it, who want to rent and stay in Northampton because this is where their community is, where they grew up here, they can't. They're living out in East Hampton, South Hampton, et cetera. That's where they're finding spaces. And consistently, it's that narrative of young families having to leave the area. And so I just want to reiterate, this is not affordable. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask you for just a clarification on the Conservation Commission? 
Commission. So my understanding is that the Conservation Commission is not required to issue a permit for this, or they are. Oh, so they have. Um, there is a filing for the Conservation Commission. Okay. Um, there, um, there's the wetlands buffer is shown. Um, of the 100 foot um, buffer. Can you speak up, please? Buffer. Yeah, so the wetland buffers are shown on the plans. Um, they do have to go to a conservation commission for work within the 100 foot buffer. And in this district, there's um, a standard that's different than in the, more of the suburban areas where um, you can develop up to the 35 foot buffer. Um, but you need a permit from the Conservation Commission. So that's a separate process, separate jurisdiction, okay. and the Conservation Commission will be looking at that. Okay, so just to reiterate, and they are meeting this month? Um, they met a later this month. Okay, so just to reiterate, the Conservation Commission does have to issue a permit for this project as well. They will be reviewing specifically the impacts on wetlands um, and making their own determination at a later date, later this month. Um, and that is a public hearing, as I understand. So that is a public hearing, so there will be um, another body that has its own specialized expertise and experience in conservation of wetlands looking at, at these plants and exactly the, the issues that were raised. Hello, my name is Bob Walker. I live at 13 Fort Street. Um, I just think it's unfair to use the traffic study that he used, the traffic study that was used in 2006. I know as a resident, I know since then, the Hospital Hill development has filled in this incredible amount of more traffic on South Street. Uh, you know, I mean, from 2013 years, I can see the visual difference. I know there are many mornings that I can hardly get out of my street, and Fourth Street's about five or six blocks up from Dewey Court, and the traffic's backed up blocks past there. Uh, I just, and I apologize, I didn't hear the discussion with Jim Nash about how you can request a current full-scale traffic review, but I think that should be part of the requirements of this project, because I feel the outdated traffic study doesn't, you know, relate to the current conditions. Thank you. Thank you. But you're running out of people. <laughs> uh, Sherry Brunel, 279 South Street. Um, this is the second time I've come to the planning board with the same developer presenting uh, development Can you, can you, you speak up, please? I'm sorry. Uh, I'll turn around something. You just can't hear you. Okay. Here at all. I'll do my best. You guys need a microphone. It's most critical. We hear her. Yes, yeah. to the extent that she, you can hear her as well. well that is, both. That is icing. <laughs> uh, so this is the second time I've been to the planning board um, in response to a development by Ben Lewis. Uh, first was Olive and South Street. Uh, which was contentious, also a little bit. Um, what I haven't seen in his presentation, their presentation, though, was very smart, professional, and minimized the impact and maximized how they considered the spot and the requirements. And they kept saying, we went just over the requirements, right? We didn't do the minimum. We went more than the minimum. What I didn't hear is any solutions to some of the issues that were obvious from the beginning, and I'm sure in his meeting with the abutters came up. So traffic, is there a way to restrict cars in the rental agreement for these apartments, right? When you sign a rental agreement, the developer, the owner of the property has rights to restrict. Could there be one car per, per apartment? Therefore, they have to monitor and prevent a buildup of cars that could limit the parking spaces limit traffic. There are solutions that haven't been brought to bear because it sounds like there is a minimization of what the development team wants to do in order to help a solution, what's needed for solutions. Same thing with the views from the abutters. Is there an offering to plant larger trees, right? You put in some investment to the shade trees that would be needed, move the carport a little bit, maybe a couple less parking spaces if they restrict the park the cars allowed on the property so that the butters don't have to lose their view and have two-story people with windows right you know facing them like new york city with buildings right next to each other which is not what, we are. what i haven't heard is their attempt to go above and beyond to live to the spirit of this town the spirit of compatibility in the area not just maximizing or being close to maximizing the infill and the profit that's going to be made off this property. So I feel like there is not a good spirit of partnership and collaboration on the development team with the city, this master sustainability plan, 
you know, our shade tree committee that we have spent a ton of time trying to improve a lot of effort into that and the investment the city is putting into it to take down extremely large trees that are significant. Uh, that is the northernmost point of the tulip trees that are in New England. And it's just, it would be nice to see if there's planning board has the power to encourage some maybe extra from the development team in order to make this thing go. So that's my two cents. Thank you. Yeah, can you just say your name one more time, just for the minutes? Sherry Brunel. Sherry Brunel. Thank you very much. Any other remaining comments from the public? If not, we will take a very short. I would like to make one quick comment. Yes. And I don't know if I'm allowed to address some things. Um, so we'll ask for your name, your address? My, I'm sorry, my name is David Reinhardt. I live at uh, Ben Dewey Court. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there was a gentleman over here, I believe it was you. You asked what the difference between an F and an F minus is. The person who is legally blind and having been bumped by cars, not paying attention, it's a big difference. So don't mitigate that and say it's okay. Okay. Recently it happened where somebody was coming down the street. The person is in a room right now. He's busy looking up South Street and he wants to get out to the intersection. Okay. He was gracious enough about it. He backed up, said, I'm sorry. But there's been times where it's come to the point it's knocked my groceries. It's done a lot of things. This is not an isolated incident. The woman previously <coughs> said, Oh, I'm looking for affordable housing. <laughs> we brought this up when we had our meeting at the 15th of May with the developer. His statement was is one bedroom. His anticipated figure is about $1,800, $2,800 or more for two bedrooms. So her criteria that she's using and arguing about affordability, we're not comparing apples and apples. So I'm asking all of you to take a minute and find out all the information. A traffic study, who? I'm one of three legally blind people in the neighborhood. That immediate thing that walk across Dewey Court and South Street daily. Okay, in 350-10, section two, it states that special permits must take in the needs of disabled people. I hate using the blind card and everything else, but we're not just, you know, talking about a couple extra cars. So. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, just to follow up to that, um, <coughs> he does it on the road. He walks in the road because the pavements aren't usable. The pavements aren't maintained. They're impassable. They're not accessible. So the road is our primary way of walking on the road. And so, that, is, that is absolutely something that, that folks should be talking with their city councilor about uh, improving. Thank you. Uh, if, are there any other remaining comments from the public? If not, we will take a five minute bathroom uh, break. Yes. I, I want to understand the, um, the 50 foot frontage um, in relation to what we've been hearing as the width of the road as 27. Yeah. Well, I, I think there's, there's an issue. So frontage is along the length of the road. The 27 foot reference is about the width of the road itself. So when we measure frontage for parcels, it's how much of the lot along the length of the road a property has. And um, so they're two different numbers. They're so not. This, they're does, not. this doesn't have any length. Right, right. By um, Northampton's definition, you can't count frontage at the end of the street. So technically, it has zero frontage, so that's but it has access. Quantity. But it has access for the road. So your deliberation is whether changing the uses um, is um, from a single family to a 15 unit, so 14 additional units. Is that substantially more detrimental in terms of the access from the street to the parcel because that's what prompted it. I'm sorry, I still don't exactly understand the difference between 15 and 24. That's for the zoning board. <laughs> I mean, we can explain it, but essentially you don't have to weigh in on it. Right. <laughs> 
we technically, if I understand correctly, the, the, the site does not technically have any frontage that are, that because, it's, it. because it faces the end of Dewey Court and the end of a road doesn't count as frontage. But, it, but, it, but physically, on the ground, it has 50 feet along the end of Dewey Court. Right. So where it and, the, and I assume the pavement for the length of Dewey Court, the paved surface is 27 feet wide. Is that what people are saying? Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So like sidewalk to sidewalk, I mean, Whatever the case is, that's 27. The entry into it is 16 feet. No, it's um, so the next, the next point of order would be about um, how we will handle the portion. Right. Yeah. So after the 16. Well, I think there, there's a uh, groundswell of support for a, a bathroom break. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so we would like to do a five-minute break if we can, and then come back and, and uh, if there are no other comments from the public and no other clarifications needed from the applicant, uh, then we will be closing the public hearing, and you all can talk and deliberate and make your decision. And or you talk over to you separate. Yeah. <laughs> I think we should use ours first and they should say. still be me and Elizabeth Silver and Bob Riddle. Okay. Um, so the I, well, I, I, don't, I don't know if any members of the zoning board want to just go ahead and comment on the, the specific question which is does the zoning board of appeals feel that it has heard enough Close the public hearing for the zoning board of appeals, and um, and have um, a discuss. That would take a motion on that, and then a motion on the application. In our case, for a finding, and then have a discussion. Right. Do you have a procedural question? Yes, I do. I, I was listening to the I was aware that we had three minutes to talk to the planning board about the one issue and that we would get three minutes to comment on this issue of 50 foot right away. What we said in the beginning is that we are combining, you know, we're doing everything, presentation and public comment at the same time. So I will oh, ask I the zoning board if, the, you know, if you want to take additional <coughs> public comment, that's at your discretion. Yeah, I, I, I'm reluctant to reopen everything for a lot of comments, but is, is there just one person here who wanted to just specifically to, to make a comment specifically to the zoning boards, uh, the application that's pending before the zoning board. If, if, if it's one person uh, and it wasn't clear before, uh, it could be very brief. Thank you. I understand the issue of the, the, the no frontage, and I've met this issue numerous times. And typically, the solution is that when they do the site plan, they extend the road 50 feet and get their frontage. I've done that several times. And the solution to the, uh, the situation of the cul-de-sac width, which is substandard, is that you build an extension of the road with a cul-de-sac and build your project around it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I guess I'll just ask, do we have a, a motion? Do we feel like we can make a motion to close the public hearing for the Zone Board of Appeals? So, okay. 
Yes. Second. Second. That's all in favor. That's unanimous. Um, do we have a motion on the application for the finding from the Zoning Board of Appeals? We can have discussion before or after a motion. I can make a motion. Um, I, I can make a motion to approve the application as with respect to the zoning piece solely. Um, I don't have the, the specifics here. Sorry. Saving paper. It's right here. <laughs> Can't really hear you. 31D217. Could, people couldn't hear if you wouldn't mind, since it's the motion. Okay, it's it's just the motion to approve the um, application of um, uh, of Benjamin Lewis for 15 residential units and site related development at 34 Dewey Court, map ID 31D217. And this is just with respect to the zoning board issue. And I second that. Okay. Discussion. Um, I have a couple of thoughts. Um, I, there are clearly a host of issues here, um, not least of which relating to traffic uh, at the intersection of Dewey Court and South Street. Um, I did. I did make a couple of notes because I heard some concern about preserving trees, but I also thought I heard that 35 of 37, the 37 large trees are actually being preserved. But, but I don't think that relates to um, to our the, the motion before our board. Um, and and my my personal feeling is that while the planning board has plenty of work to be done here, addressing the concerns that have been raised. Um, I don't believe that the 50 feet, the technical, purely technical lack of frontage um, is what matters here because um, to me that is sort of form over substance. The substance is that 50 feet of the front of this parcel faces a public road. It just happens to be the end of that public road. And there are other issues about how narrow the paved surface area is. But 50 feet is there. And I think that the other issues and concerns that have raised, been raised, uh, which I, I consider to be legitimate and sincere and, and, and well presented by the neighbors and the members of the public, don't relate to our issue, which is, does this 50-foot question at the entry point to the site make a difference? Or more specifically, does is the project substantially more detrimental to the characteristics of the neighborhood, which I think is a question either way, because of the 50-foot issue? And, 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 and my view is that that is not the issue here. Is there plenty of other issues, but that is not the issue here. That will be the same change. Right. So I understand. And that's the deliberations really as you We can't hear you. Sorry. They're making a lot of noise back there. It's an emergency problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard to talk through. I, I was tending to agree that the issue is more related to the planning board and that because the frontage issue will remain identical in either scenario that it's not going to be more detrimental. Um, and so I would agree with what David just said with respect to the planning board. So, uh, oh, so the motion's been made um, to approve the request for the finding from the Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, and uh, it's been seconded. We've had our discussion, and uh, I think we can take our vote. All, all in favor of the motion, and that's you know, else's way. <laughs> and, we, and we need to move, 
Right. Oh, we closed it. I think we need to move to adjourn. We have to adjourn. So motion to adjourn. Second, all in favor of Aren't they required to say?